I want to welcome everybody and thank you for taking the time out of your days and your evening um, to spend a little bit of time with me to, to learn about uh, the cervical spine. And today we're going to be focusing on neck arthritis, both surgical and non-surgical options. I have no financial disclosures. Um, today, we're gonna, I'm gonna do a brief introduction about me um, in case you haven't met me before. Um, then I'll introduce how I like to approach spine pathologies, um, not only specific to the cervical or, or neck, but I'll also talk about mid-back thoracic pathologies as well as an introduction to lumbar or lower back pathologies as well. But the main portion of tonight's talk is gonna be focusing on neck arthritis. Um, the medical terminology that you'll see in radiology reports and in medical literature is cervical spondylosis, and that, that term will be used interchangeably with neck arthritis throughout this talk. Um, I'll touch upon how arthritis develops, um, the symptoms associated with arthritis ranging from neck pain to radiculopathy to myelopathy. I'll talk about how we work up patients with neck uh, problems. Um, both in the clinic and from an imaging perspective. And then I'll introduce some treatment options, including case examples. So about myself, I'm from Michigan, uh, originally born in the Metro Detroit area and raised. Um, I've done my education and training throughout the Midwest. I did my orthopedic surgery residency at Northwestern in Chicago. And I did a combined orthopedic and neurosurgical uh, spine fellowship at the Cleveland Clinic. I'm lucky to be back in my hometown serving the community that um, has served me so well. And in my spare time, uh, I love to play ice hockey. I love to cook for my family. Um, and I like to golf on occasion as well. So whenever I'm uh, approaching a patient that's presenting to me with lower back, neck, or mid-back issues, um, the main thing that we need to do is differentiate um, what the different pathologies are that could be affecting the patient. So when we talk about degenerative issues or arthritis, that's the most common type of pathology that I see. And those are chronic, which means longer term wear and tear conditions. And the medical terminology you'll see are, are spondylosis, which I already introduced, spondylolisthesis, which refers to a slip disc, which is when one of the bones that make up the structure in the back has slipped forward in relation to the bone below it. Um, the, the terminology that we'll use is a slip disc or a spondylolisthesis. Uh, degenerative disc disease is also used interchangeably with bulging disc or disc protrusions. If you think about the disc like a jelly donut, if you flatten out a disc, it'll expand circumferentially, but the height of the disc will decrease over time. Um, and that's what a bulging disc or a, a disc protrusion refers to. That's different than a disc herniation where part of the jelly on the inside of the disc actually squirts loose. Uh, degenerative conditions are the most common issues that I see, but degenerative pathologies can develop into deformities. Um, deformities are curvatures or abnormal um, alignments of the spine. So you talk about scoliosis, which is an abnormal curvature when you're looking at somebody straight on. Um, kyphosis refers to a humpback deformity. Um, and deformities can happen because of failed prior surgery or degeneration around prior surgeries. Um, traumatic pathologies I also treat. So these can range from low energy falls from standing um, to high energy car accidents or falls off of ladders or injuries at construction sites. And these can range from soft tissue injuries to bone injuries to bone and ligamentous injuries to injuries involving neurologic tissue. Um, so the way that I approach these patients is very different than a degenerative patient who's often had symptoms for um, a longer period of time. I also take care of patients with tumors. Um, and the way that we approach that depends on the type of tissue that's involved, whether it's um, a bone tumor, um, a nerve tumor, a tumor of the muscle. And it depends whether the tumor um, or cancer came from somewhere else or if it's primarily a tumor that arose in the spine. I also take care of patients with infections and these infections can either arise from distant places and spread via the bloodstream or lymphatic system, or they can be a consequence of prior surgery um, that's, these, uh, that's these an infection. When we talk about spine pathologies, we also differentiate um, where the pathology is located, what sort of symptoms it's causing. And one of the things I alluded to that's important is how long the symptoms have been present. So when we talk about location, 
the the occiput is another name for the skull. So occipitocervical refers to the junction of the head and neck. The cervical spine refers to the neck, and that's what we're focusing on today. The thoracic spine refers to the mid back or the portion that's connected to the ribs in the front. The lumbar spine refers to the lower spine, and the sacrum is often used interchangeably with the tailbone. That's the very bottom of the spine. When we talk about symptoms, I ask my patients about pain, um, and that helps me differentiate between pain in the neck or the lower back versus pain in the extremity. That makes me think about different causes of the pain. Um, axial pain refers to pain along the spinal column. Radiculopathy refers to pain in the distribution of a nerve. So that often um, presents with symptoms where that nerve is going. And in the neck, the nerves go down the arm into the hand. Uh, myelopathy refers to compression on the spinal cord, which can cause neurologic symptoms. And I'll get into that a little bit later in this talk. Paresthesias refers to pins and needles sensation. Patients can present with numbness. They can present with weakness. Sciatica is a, a common term that's referred to any um, nerve-mediated pain down the thigh. Neurogenic claudication is another um, another diagnosis that I treat where people have stenosis or narrowing around the nerves in the lower back, which limits their ability to walk and to use their lower extremities. When we think about chronicity, we talk about like, uh, how acute the symptoms have been there. So the symptoms present after somebody bent over and they threw their back out, or did somebody lift something wrong and have shooting pain down their arms immediately? Or have these symptoms been there for many months, sometimes years, and are either slowly getting worse or just not getting better? Um, and another thing for me that I always talk about with my patients as a surgeon is I need to know if they've had prior surgeries because that not only changes the way that I approach them in their workup, but it changes sometimes the imaging that we need um, and you know some of the decisions that we make in clinic. So when patients have not had any prior surgery, we call that a virgin spine but I also treat a lot of patients that have had prior surgeries elsewhere, and that's called a revision surgery if, if they need more surgery. When we talk about types of surgeries, um, there are different ways to think about that. So you can think about where the surgery is being done at, and when we talk about ways that I approach the spine, I can do it from the front, certain locations I can do it from the side, and then the entire spine you can access from the back um, with, with some caveats. So some surgeries I do anterior from the front, some are posterior from the back, some are from the side or lateral, and some are circumferential, which means that work is done through both the front and the back. Um, when we talk about surgery, we talk about motion sparing versus fusion surgery. Fusions refer to the bones and the joints in the spinal column. When we do a fusion, we want to eliminate motion in those joints because we want the bones to heal to each other. There are certain certain diagnoses and certain pathologies where that is the goal of surgery. When we're correcting a deformity, when we're treating a fracture or break in the bone, um, these are reasonable instances where you want to have a fusion because you don't want any motion or instability in the spine. But for the most part, as time goes on, surgery has become more motion sparing. We don't want to lose the motion with fusion surgeries. And the other baggage that comes along with it, which I'll get into. Um, also, as time has gone on, we've moved towards more minimally invasive surgery. Minimally invasive in general refers to surgery that is less morbid or has less of an, um, a negative impact on the tissues that we perform the surgery on. Um, there's not a great specific definition for it. A lot of people will use minimally invasive as a marketing term. But in general, the field of spine surgery is moving towards more minimally invasive techniques. These can refer to microscopic surgeries where incisions are very small, and I do plenty of those. Minimally invasive can refer to special retractors that we use. And sometimes it can just refer to the fact that surgeries are done on an outpatient basis where patients don't need to stay in the hospital anymore. Um, furthermore, as, as time goes on, the technologies involved with the spine have continued to evolve. And we use navigation, which is using 3D image guided um, instruments in the operating room, robotics, and 3D printed implants. There, there's plenty of exciting technologies that continue to develop and evolve every year. 
uh, but that's a whole separate talk. When we talk about how patients are gonna to respond to surgery, um, when we talk about their outcomes, it's a combination of a few different variables. It's not as simple as just having surgery and you're better the next day. Um, when we talk about the ultimate outcome of the patient, the technique of the surgery is definitely important, but the expectations before surgery are equally as important. And really the most important thing in my opinion is the indications for surgery. Are we doing surgery for the right problem for the patient? We need to make sure that the abnormalities on the imaging correlates to the symptoms the patient's having and that we are talking about their benefits, risk, and alternatives to surgical management, okay? And I'll get into which pathologies or diagnoses um, surgery may be more of an urgent discussion versus something that can always be discussed down the road. So getting into the meat of the talk, we're focusing on neck arthritis, again, cervical spondylosis, and this refers to age-related degenerative changes of the cervical spine or the neck. And the image you're looking at is an MRI image. In the center of this image, the long dark stripe in the center is the spinal cord and the white surrounding it is cerebrospinal fluid. And on the left, these lighter boxes are the bone or vertebral bodies in the front of the spine. And the dark spaces in between them are the disc. The disc are the shock absorbers in between the blocks of bone. And the skin of the back of the neck is all the way to the right here. Okay. When we talk about the anatomy of the cervical spine, we talk about joints. Joints are where bones meet with other bones for motion and, and movement. Um, the spine has five different places in the cervical spine or the neck where it actually has, has a joint or motion. The, probably the most obvious is the intervertebral disc where those blocks of bones meet up with each other in the front um, as indicated by that arrow. The other two joints um, that are a little bit more behind that actually on the sides of the blocks of bones are called the uncovertebral joints. And you have one on each side of the spine. And then the facet joints are actually in the back of the spine. And again, you have one of those on each side as well. So you have five total joints. So when we're doing fusions, we, we always keep that in mind that these are the joints where people have motion and these are where the motion needs to be eliminated if we're doing a fusion. Arthritis develops because the disc dehydrates and loses water as um, as time goes on. So when that happens, the, the disc accumulates damage because it doesn't have a good blood flow. It's an avascular disc. As a result of that, the disc loses height and those bones get closer to each other over time. Like I mentioned, the disc can bulge as it degenerates over time and loses height. And this encroaches or comes in contact with the, the area where the nerves and the spinal cord are normally occupied. This causes alterations of the biomechanics of the neck, and this causes hypertrophy or growth. Your body normally tries to protect itself by growing more ligament and more bone to stabilize the area. Um, that's, that's part of the body's normal response, and we start developing this vicious cycle um, where the body tries to, to heal itself and it starts taking up more space that those nerves want and it continues to alter the biomechanics. The, the disc continues to degrade over time and, and it's really a cycle that we're trying to break with research, but we're still a ways away. Like I had mentioned earlier, one of the most important things is ascertaining whether or not the patient's symptoms correlate to the patient's imaging. So if the symptoms don't make sense with the abnormalities with the imaging or the imaging is totally normal, it's hard for me to um, tell the patient that their symptoms are coming from the neck. A lot of other things can mimic uh, neck pathologies. Um, as we know in, in studies that we've done in ace, asymptomatic adults, so patients without any issues, We've done imaging studies and a quarter of people under the age of 40 
have evidence of early degenerative changes. So this is a part of life and a part of aging, but it doesn't always cause symptoms or problems. So that's why it's important when you're being evaluated by your primary care doctor or a specialist, it's important for them to take a history and do an exam and look at your imaging and figure out if the picture, if the puzzle makes sense. And as you can see, you know, approaching over 90% of people over the age of 60 um, that have evidence of these degenerative changes. When we talk about symptoms, I, I'm always trying to differentiate how much of the patient's symptoms are coming from neck pain versus the nerves being irritated, and that's called radiculopathy, versus the spinal cord being irritated, and that's called myelopathy. If we think about this gray streak in the center of the spinal column, the spinal cord as a freeway, at each level, there are nerves that come off on both the left and the right side. They're almost like off ramps at each level. So it's like a freeway with off ramps as you come down the cervical spine. Radiculopathy is when there's irritation at the off ramp, when those nerves are irritated. Myelopathy refers to congestion at the freeway. The spinal cord is irritated and sick. And I'll discuss this a little bit more as we go on. And these are not mutually exclusive, okay? So um, a lot of times patients can come in with um, overlapping symptoms and um, diagnoses that include all three of these. But symptomatic arthritis is the leading cause of radiculopathy and myelopathy. Cervical radiculopathy or um, irritation of the nerve as it leaves the spinal column um, is caused by the arthritic changes. It can also be caused by disc herniations. Disc herniations usually will present more acutely when people will either have um, accidents or falls in uh, an onset of symptoms with nerve irritation that does not happen slowly over time. It's more of an acute thing. But when with arthritis being the most common cause, um, what happens is it's basically a decrease in the area that the nerve has available to leave the spinal column. So the nerve is irritated and pinched. Um, this leads to both mechanical compression, but also um, inflammatory mediated, mediated changes as well. And you'll see in some of the medications that we use that we're able to treat the patient's symptoms by focusing on this inflammatory pathway. Radiculopathy, almost all patients will present with arm pain, but you'll also see a predominance of, of patients with associated neck pain as well. Um, frequently, they'll have sensory deficits, which could include numbness or tingling um, or, a, a, or an asymmetry in sensation compared to the other side. Um, but people can also present with uh, other weird symptoms like headaches, uh, scapular pain. So we're very frequently doing shoulder exams. Um, and, you know, on the occasion, patients can present with weakness as well um, in the muscle groups that the nerves go to. When I'm doing an exam in the clinic, I'm evaluating all these different nerve roots by testing the patient's strength, by testing their sensation, by testing their reflexes. A spurling maneuver is having the patient rotate their head and extend their neck. And sometimes we'll push axial compression down. And when that is positive, that's a reproduction of the symptoms in the distribution of that nerve. Myelopathy is very different. That's a spinal cord compression issue. And very frequently these patients will present without pain. And they'll often have symptoms that are slowly getting worse over time, but nobody's identified quite exactly what the cause is because it's hard to think about the neck necessarily with, with these symptoms that don't seem related. So patients will very frequently present with difficulty with balance and difficulty with fine motor function. So in the clinic, I will have my patients walk and I'll have them do a heel to toe walk. And patients with myelopathy, they sway and they're unable to do heel to toe walking. Um, I will ask my patients about fine motor tasks. So buttoning buttons, keys and doorknobs, eating utensils. 
those are the type of things that people develop issues with. And sometimes they unintentionally start dropping items. They can have numbness and tingling in the hands. And on exam, they'll very frequently have an increase in their reflexes uh, because this is what we call an upper motor neuron issue or a spinal cord issue. It's not the nerve going into the extremity. It's, it's the spinal cord itself. There are other findings that people can, can have with myelopathy because this is usually a chronic, long, longer term compression on the spinal cord. So people can present with muscle atrophy or loss of muscle in their hand, uh, difficulty with grasping, um, and they can present with abnormal reflexes in both the hand and in the feet. Neck pain is very different. Um, when people present with just neck pain, most commonly, that is not due to a nerve compression issue. The most common causes of neck pain are muscle strain. Um, and this is one of the most common reasons patients present to um, you know, medical providers and, and urgent care. Um, other causes could be poor posture or minor trauma, but usually this is a localized superficial pain that is tender to the touch. Um, and that usually would suggest a muscle strain or soft tissue issue, particularly when it's worse when you bend your chin down towards your chest because you're stretching those muscles. Um, other causes of neck pain can be arthritis itself or discogenic pain, pain from the degenerated disc or shock absorber in between those blocks of bones. And that's usually diagnosed by aggravation with extension or looking up and rotation. When we talk about imaging for the spine, um, and this is not just the cervical spine, uh, we usually will start with x-rays and the most common imaging study that we get to look at the soft tissues or the disc material and the nerves themselves are the MRI studies and a CT scans are great for us to look at bones and uh, I'll get into what a myelogram is. We are doing these less and less nowadays with the advent of MRIs. However, in, in general, when people initially present with cervical radiculopathy, because the natural history is favorable, um, we don't often necessarily need to get imaging studies within the first few weeks of the onset of symptoms. These studies suggest that over three quarters, 75% to 90% of people experience symptomatic improvement within those six weeks. Um, therefore, imaging studies can be delayed you know, for four to six weeks in many patients because it's not going to change the treatment. And it's not, uh, if it's not going to change the treatment, it's, it's just using the patient's time and money. And if it's not going to impact the treatment or change clinical decision-making, um, you know, there's, there's really not, a, not necessarily a utility to getting it that early. However, there are certain conditions where we want, you know, imaging right away. So um, there are certain clinical characteristics, as you see in this table, that would make us want to um, work up other pathologies. And we're talking you know, quote unquote, red flag symptoms, so fevers, chills, night sweats, unintended weight loss, progressive neurologic issues, so weakness that's getting worse and worse, um, history of cancer, you know, those type of things. But, but that is not the, the common patient. When we get x-rays, these are um, radiographic pictures. Um, we get them from the front and from the side, so those are AP and lateral images. And we're looking for arthritis, fractures or breaks in the bone and the overall alignment. Sometimes we'll have the patients do flexion extension radiographs where they put their chin on their chest and look up towards the ceiling to assess for the stability and look for fusion of segments. As I said earlier, the MRI or magnetic resonance imaging is the modality of choice um, when we are doing surgical planning. This helps us identify the neural elements, soft, the, the, the disc tissue, um, we're also able to see the ligamentum, the vertebral arteries. We get a much better picture of the overall anatomy as opposed to the x-ray, which really gives us a great view of the bones, but um, doesn't allow us to see the nerves themselves. The MRI is done while the patient is supine or laying down. So we're often able to see if there's any instability or motion in the spine when we compare it to the x-rays, because I have my patients do their x-rays when they're standing up. And again, most important thing is correlating the, the imaging findings with the patient's symptoms. MRIs allow us to visualize the spinal cord um, and 
when there's compression over time, the spinal cord can actually show changes. So on this image on the right, the gray streak in the center of the spinal column, the spinal cord has this white hazy change in the center of it where the compression is the worst. This is behind C3-4. Um, spinal cord changes have been detected in over 60% of patients with symptomatic cervical myelopathy. Cervical myelopathy or, or neck sickness of the spinal cord. Um, but it's not been shown to consistently correlate with prognosis or treatment. So we're still um, doing active research on this, but this is something that we see oftentimes in compression that's severe for longer periods of time. CT scans give us the best view of the bones. So we'll often um, get these imaging studies in patients that have had prior surgeries uh, or patients where we're looking for fusions. Um, this is a 3D representation of x-rays stacked on top of each other. Um, there, this is a radiation study as opposed to the MRI, which is without radiation. Um, so that is one of the downsides of, of CT scans. Prior to MRIs becoming popular and widespread, um, we used to assess stenosis or narrowing around the nerves by injecting dye in the spinal column around the nerves in the epidural space. This is called a myelogram, and this is an invasive procedure. The contrast is injected right around the nerves. And we really only do this now for patients that are unable to go on MRI, such as patients with certain types of pacemakers and patients with cochlear implants. EMG studies assess the health of nerves and the muscles that they connect to. And this helps us identify nerve versus muscle versus connection issues. Um, and may help us identify areas of nerve compression. Nerves can be compressed in the extremity. It's not only in the neck. So that, those are other things that I look for on exam. Carpal tunnel, nerves can get compressed in the elbow. So just because you have numbness and tingling in the arm or the hand does not mean it's necessarily coming from the neck. When we talk about treatment, uh, neck pain has the most variable prognosis given the variable causes. Um, some people come into my clinic with 20 years of neck pain that have had multiple prior surgeries that have really bad arthritis or, or problems from their prior surgeries. And it's hard initially um, for, for me to ascertain the likelihood of success with some of those patients. Sometimes it takes me a few visits um, and, if, and seeing them a few different times to figure out a game plan for them. However, the, like I said, the vast majority of these patients are having issues, particularly those with acute issues, are secondary to musculoligamentous or soft tissue issues. And the vast majority of, of those diagnoses are amenable to non-surgical treatment. So we're talking medications, therapy, icing, heat, massage, and I'll get into more specifics. Cervical radiculopathy has a favorable natural history. So it often resolves without surgery, but frequently the symptoms are severe enough to, to warrant medications and other treatments. Myelopathy does not get better without surgery. Um, and, and I'll get into that as well. Conservative treatment should be offered to all patients with new onset radiculopathy with, not, with no evidence of myelopathy. And it's very important to encourage your patients and set expectations for recovery. Remember expectations are just as important as technique and indications if the, the patients have got to be on the same page as, as the provider, um, if, if we want a successful outcome. Conservative treatments for neck pain, um, the least invasive um, interventions that we have, massage, heat, ice, these can help break down muscle spasms, increase blood flow, reduce swelling and inflammation. Um, some of these modalities work better for other patients versus, versus others. So I often encourage my patients to to try both and figure out which one works better for you. Physical therapy is often very useful. Um, and it's not only stretching and, and range of motion, there's strengthening exercises, um, there's pain modulation techniques, there's postural exercises. Um, it's very important to work with the therapist and then continue to do what they teach you at home, even after your symptoms are better. That helps keep your neck in good working condition. Okay, it's, uh, it's like brushing your teeth every day. And, and I know I'm biased, but you want to continue to keep your ligaments supple, your muscles strong, and your range of motion good. Okay. 
when we talk about medications, um, we start with over-the-counter medications. So acetaminophen or Tylenol, this is not an anti-inflammatory medication, but it is a pain reliever. This is a liver um, metabolized medication. So it's important to limit your intake over 24 hours. And this is particularly important in patients that are on narcotic pain medicines because some of those medications also have acetaminophen or Tylenol in them. Um, However, the most efficacious medications, particularly for soft musculoligamentous issues, are the non-steroidal anti-inflammatories. So over the counter, that's your ibuprofen, your Advil Motrin, um, your Aleve. Um, The prescription strength anti-inflammatories, the more popular ones are Voltaren, Celebrex, Mobic, or Meloxicam. These newer prescription strength anti-inflammatories are thought to have a decreased um, side effect profile on stomach irritation. Um, Anti-inflammatories have a very low risk of heart problems um, and a low risk of kidney issues in patients with underlying kidney issues. We always recommend taking these foods with with food to minimize the risk of GI irritation. Steroids are powerful prescription strength anti-inflammatories. They work through different pathway, um, but steroids come with baggage. Steroids at high doses and for longer periods of time come with a lot of baggage. They can affect other organ systems. They can cause a lot of different side effects, ranging from infection, bone problems like osteoporosis, um, issues with mood, weight gain, diabetes. Um, So we've figured out that using steroids for a short period of time in a low dose form mitigates those risks while also providing the powerful anti-inflammatory effect. So one of the more common medications that I will use to treat radiculopathy when I'm first seeing a patient is a medrol dose pack or methylprednisolone. And that is a six day course of steroids that decreases every day. And this usually will make patients feel better sooner rather than later. And it doesn't have the same dependence or risk profile as narcotics, but it's important to counsel patients, particularly those with diabetes that this can alter your blood sugars. um, So keep that in mind. Um, Other medications that we use are muscle relaxants. Um, These help treat muscle spasms. Um, The medication I like to use is methylcarbamol or Revaxin, um, but other commonly used medications are cyclobenzaprine or Flexeril, Pizanidine or Xanaflex. Um, These work through different pathways and everybody responds a little bit different. Some of the muscle relaxers make people a little bit sleepy and drowsy. So there is a risk for falling. So we try to avoid these medications um, in in people that are very elderly and uh, in people that have balance issues. Narcotics can be useful for a short course for patients in severe pain. And um, I use them, you know, in my post-operative pain control, you know, narcotics and opiates are used interchangeably. These are controlled pain medications. These are very popular in the media because of the opioid pandemic or epidemic that's happened. Um, So this is on all surgeons and orthopedic docs, uh, mind, you know, primary care docs. Everybody's mindful of this nowadays. The main issue with these medications is your body can develop a dependence on them, which requires increasing doses and decreasing efficacy. And at high doses, um, you know, this can lead to respiratory depression and death. So these medications are highly regulated and are useful only in particular circumstances. And in general, most folks are trying to move away from them. These are medicines like Norco or Vicodin or um, oxycodone, Percocet, morphine. But there is a, there is a use for them in, this, in certain situations. So, um, you know, in general, blanket statements are bad, um, but you just want to be mindful of things. Nerve stabilizing agents are another class of medication. This is gabapentin or Lyrica. Um, these medications historically have been used for chronic neuropathic pain, but um, as studies continue to come out, they are being more used for preoperative and acute pain control. Um, these have a similar risk profile to muscle relaxers. It can make people sleepy and drowsy um, and very fatigued feeling. Um, you know, so, that, so it's something that we titrate up the dose in patients. We slowly increase the dose over time um, to, to kind of weigh the 
impact or efficacy of the medicine with those side effects. Injections are another option for the cervical spine. Uh, medial branch blocks and injections target the facet joints in the back of the spine. This is a short procedure that can provide temporary relief. But if it's found that this is the primary mediator of the pain for the patient, um, ablations can be performed where it's a more, a more permanent burning of the nerve. Epidural steroid injections reduce inflammation along irritated nerves. This is like a direct delivery system as opposed to having the medicine absorbed through the bloodstream by taking oral medicines. This is having the medicine injected by the nerves under extra guidance. Not a permanent solution in the sense that it doesn't change the anatomy, only surgery changes the anatomy on the inside, um, but it can provide symptomatic relief as your body is healing and you know it, it can save people from surgical intervention. There are very rare but serious neurologic risks associated with cervical epidural steroid injections. And this is mostly due to the fact that the vertebral arteries are very close to the spinal column. Um, and things have happened um, in the past. So it's something that uh, patients should be aware of that this is not a zero risk procedure. When we talk about radio frequency ablations, these are the heating or the burning of the small nerves that block the pain signals to the small joints. Um, again, this can provide temporary but longer term relief. These may be repeated. And I have um, two non-operative spine partners, Dr. Slazinski and Dr. Siddiqui, um, and they're, they're excellent um, at, at, these, at these interventions. And we often share patients and try to figure out what, what the best treatment options are for them. Um, like I alluded to earlier, cervical radiculopathy, the studies have shown that the natural history is favorable. Uh, most of the time, the symptoms are self-limited and resolve spontaneously over a variable length of time. So even the North American Spine Society or, or NAS, which is one of the, the bigger spine institutions in the country um, from a spine society perspective, of which I'm a member, you know, this is a statement from them even. So just because we're surgeons does not mean that everybody needs surgery. And it's important that the patients understand that. It's always, if something smells fishy, um, get a second opinion. Um, this is different from cervical myelopathy. Cervical myelopathy, we've been studying for decades. Um, one of the landmark studies actually came out in the 50s, so almost 70 years ago. And in general, when people have compression on the spinal cord causing myelopathy, and that's difficulty with balance, difficulty with the hands, in general, those people have a stepwise deterioration over time. So they'll have a period where their symptoms don't change, and then they'll have a week or a month where their symptoms get worse, and then those symptoms will stabilize and plateau, and then again, they'll get worse. What we don't know is, what the period of stability or plateau is. That's variable with every patient. So in general, these symptoms don't get worse on a week to week basis. It's usually on months to years, but it's something you wanna keep a close eye on when you've identified cervical myelopathy and started to have that surgical discussion. So in general, cervical myelopathy tends to be progressive and is characterized by a stepwise decline in function. And it's important that patients understand that over time, this is not going to get better on its own compared to cervical radiculopathy. So operative indications, why we do surgery. Sick spinal cord does not get better without taking pressure off the spinal cord. Um, like I had mentioned, cervical radiculopathy, most patients get better without surgery but there is that small subset of patients, less than a quarter of patients that'll have persistent symptoms or that will have progressive weakness and they'll require surgical intervention. So the operative indications for, for cervical radiculopathy or nerve irritation are patients that have had symptoms for at least six weeks with imaging that makes sense with the symptoms they're having and they failed the conservative treatment. So the medications, the physical therapy, sometimes injections, but not everybody has to have injections for them. When we talk about operative options, um, 
There is a lot of different options ranging from very minimally invasive outpatient surgeries to very large circumferential from the front and back, multi-day, large, large, large surgeries. Every patient's different, every problem's different, okay? But these studies have shown that when patients are having surgery for a pinched nerve causing symptoms related to the pinched nerve, that, that taking pressure off the nerve provides symptomatic relief in more than 90% of patients. So it is efficacious, it, it's effective. My goal is to identify the correct surgery for each patient that provides the longest relief of their symptoms while minimizing the morbidity or risk, okay? And when we talk about the surgeries, we're gonna start with the less invasive surgeries and end with the most invasive surgeries. So posterior foraminotomy, this is a decompression only type surgery. So what that means is it's motion sparing, there's no fusion which means that the joints remain intact. There's still motion between the vertebral segments. There's no instrumentation, no screws and rods. And what this is, is it's creating a window in the back of the spine where the nerve exits the spinal cord. So with this, the image under C here, this is a drill bit and they're shaving away bone to create a window and this is the nerve that's exiting to the right, okay? This, this is well over 90% successful in properly selected patients. So this is the patient that has compression of one nerve on the one side, causing symptoms where that nerve is going. This is not the patient that just, just has neck pain. This is not the patient that has compression on the spinal cord. Um, this is not the patient that has compression on multiple nerves throughout the spine causing uh, multiple issues. This is a pretty focused surgery and this is done under a microscope with a small incision and patients go home the same day. So like I alluded to, there are certain things that this surgery doesn't work for. So this gets back to indications, choosing the right surgery for the right patient. So patients that have hard disc herniations, you can't take care of that with surgery from the back. With central stenosis, the spinal cord is in the way and I, you, you only have so much wiggle room, you can't move the spinal cord to get to a disc herniation in the center. Multi-level issues, um, you know, this is, you know, the foraminotomy is really focused on, on one or two nerves. The ACDF, this is the gold standard. This is one of the more common surgeries that I do, one of the most common surgeries that I do. Um, it is the gold standard. The A stands for anterior, which means the surgery is through the front of the neck. C stands for cervical, which refers to the region of the spine that we're dealing with. The D stands for discectomy, where we clean out the disc material that's compressing the nerves. And the F stands for fusion. When, when that disc space is empty, we have to maintain the space for the nerve. So we either put a piece of cadaver bone or a metallic spacer to keep that space open while bone heals in that area to create one stiff segment of bone. Again, this is well over 90% successful in relieving the arm symptoms. This can be done at one level, can be done in multiple levels. Um, this, this is the gold standard, but like I said, we're always trying to get better and improve. Fusions come with baggage. Whenever you have a fusion or the bones healing to themselves, there are a couple things you have to look out for. First, you have to make sure the fusion heals. So there's a low risk of patients not healing their fusion. And this is increased in people that are smokers. And assuming that the fusion does heal and the bones heal to themselves and there's not motion there in the future, then we have to look out for degeneration or wear and tear in the areas next to the fusion because there's still motion in those segments. So while this is the gold standard, and I do a lot of this surgery, um, we're always trying to get better and, and improve our patient outcomes. Okay. So this is a patient that ended up getting an ACDF for stenosis at C3-4. And you can see, this is a plate in the front of the neck. 
This gray rectangle is a bone implant where the disc material used to be in between these blocks of bones. And screws are used to anchor the plate into the bone. One of the newer technologies that has been developed um, over the past 20 years is cervical disc replacement or arthroplasty. And knee replacements, hip replacements, shoulder replacements are very common and becoming even more common um, over time. Cervical disc replacement um, is a similar idea. So it's replacing the worn away disc material with metallic end plates with a plastic disc. This is a motion preserving surgery because we're not fusing the joints together and it removes the risk associated with fusion failure and adjacent segment degeneration. Because this is a newer surgery, the longer term results in terms of the lifespan of the implant um, and ultimate long-term um, studies are still being completed. But after what looks like an increased initial cost, you know, the cervical disc replacement is likely more cost effective over time with a possible decreased reoperation rate compared to the fusions because you don't have to deal with that adjacent segment issue. However, the ideal patient for a cervical disc replacement is not the standard patient that I see. In general, when we're doing a disc replacement, this is good for patients with a disc that is worn away at one or two levels but not in patients that have arthritis throughout their neck. We want, when we replace a disc, we want to make sure that patients have good motion at the other joints in their neck so that they can use the disc appropriately. If patients have too much arthritis in other areas and there's not enough motion, you can actually have fusion through the, the arthroplasty device. So in general, these are younger patients with less arthritis and good motion but as time's going on, we're starting to do this for more and more patients. This was only FDA approved for single level procedures initially, and now it's approved for two level procedures. So as time goes on, um, you'll probably see more of this. This is a young patient that presented with radiculopathy or arm pain that ended up getting a, a disc replacement. She went home the same day and had the immediate relief of her symptoms in the PACU. Um, but again, she didn't have much arthritis throughout the, the rest of her neck. So she's able to utilize the motion that she gets with that, with that disc replacement. Laminoplasty is a posterior surgery or from the back of the neck. And while this is a motion sparing surgery, it's not a fusion surgery. This is a surgery where we do use instrumentation with plates and screws. But essentially what we're doing is we are increasing the volume or the area that's available for the spinal cord. So at the bottom of this slide here on the very left, you're looking at a cross section of the spinal cord, okay? So at the very bottom, the red, this is the block of bone in the front of the spine. The red on both sides are the joints and the yellow are the nerves. In the center here, this is the spinal cord. And laminoplasty is used to treat a sick spinal cord or compression on the spinal cord in the center of, of the spine. And what this surgery is, is it is a hinge. What we do is we hinge open the lamina or the arch of bone that protects the spinal cord by drilling completely through one side. And then we hinge it open to create more space. So we completely drill through one side, we partially drill through the other side, and that allows us to hinge it open. And we keep the hinge open with a plate and screws. And this increases the area available for the spinal cord. This is used for myelopathy or spinal cord compression. And when we treat spinal cord compression and take pressure off the spinal cord, the goal is to decrease the risk to decrease the risk of progression of myelopathy. We do not want the symptoms to get worse. 60 to 70% of patients do have an improvement in their symptoms over one to two years after the surgery, but the main goal of treating myelopathy is to prevent it from getting worse. So this patient had multi-level central stenosis, as you can see in this MRI, 
with some spinal cord signal change. And this was a multi-level laminoplasty. And you can see the plates on the x-rays, but they're only on the one side because again, we're hinging open that lamina. The most aggressive and invasive um, and historical procedure for the cervical spine is the posterior decompression infusion. So this is removing bone in the center, uh, which is called a laminectomy, and that decompresses the spinal cord. And then the fusion is using the plate or using the screws and rods to heal the joints together to prevent motion. And this prevents instability and loss of alignment over time. However, because you are detaching the muscles from the lamina in the center of the neck, and then you remove the bone, um, a lot of times people can have persistent issues with neck pain. Um, sometimes they can have um, issues with the muscles healing back in the correct position as well. But these, this is a useful surgery for people with multi-level issues. So this is a patient um, that I treated with both congenital and degenerative issues. And we had to do a fusion from his occiput or his, neck or his head all the way into his thoracic spine to prevent any more motion and to take pressure off the spinal cord. So this is a multiple day inpatient stay, um, working with therapy. Some people go to rehab. This is much more involved, much more invasive than the first surgery, the foraminotomy surgery that I introduced, um, which is an outpatient surgery with minimal blood loss and an incision about that big. So everybody's problems are different. Um, every patient's different. So just because you hear about a friend or family member that had some surgery done for some problem doesn't necessarily mean it applies to you. My take home points are that spondylosis and arthritis are synonymous, and this is age related wear and tear. Just because you have changes on your imaging doesn't mean that it's the cause of your symptoms. So it's important to see a healthcare professional that can figure that out. Um, you know, that, that's what my job is. When I see patients, it's important to differentiate neck pain versus radiculopathy versus myelopathy. And these are very different clinical presentations. So it's important to ask the right questions and to do a proper examination. A thorough workup is critical for diagnosis and treatment. And the appropriate diagnosis um, directly translates into the outcome. You have to have the right diagnosis. Neck pain alone is often treated non-operatively. The natural history is favorable for cervical radiculopathy or nerve pinching, but not so much for spinal cord pinching or myelopathy. It's reasonable to trial non-operative management in all patients with cervical radiculopathy, um, but there are multiple operative options with proven outcomes in the appropriate patients, ranging from minimally invasive outpatient surgery um, to large revision, multi-level decompression fusions um, that require a longer hospital stay. So uh, I, I very much appreciate your time. And it's, it's really been an honor talking to you tonight. I, I appreciate it. Thank you.